Hello everyone, welcome to Drydock episode 119. This week's questions are taken from Guide 183, the Guide to the Leander class cruisers, and the video on Wednesday from the Great White Fleet. So, question time begins now. Bcoop1701 asks, I've noticed the midships aviation facilities and it brought to mind, to mind a question. I've read that when the Americans shifted their aviation facilities to the quarterdeck on their later cruisers and battleships, the British looked at that but didn't think the arrangement would work in the North Sea or North Atlantic because of the amount of motion the stern would be under in the vertical direction in typical seas. Since several American fast battleships spent time with the home fleet waiting on Tirpitz to show itself, is there any record of floatplane operations by American battleships running into the problems anticipated by the Royal Navy? As specifically regards American battleships operating their scout aircraft in the Arctic convoy areas, that's something I'd have to look into in a bit more detail, probably look into the ship's action reports for those convoys, which means I'll have to find out where those are stored, but certainly a good research project. However, from what I have read regarding the issues, it's not so much about the movement, it's more about safety, operation, and stability, as well as a little bit of durability for aircraft when it comes to the differences between American and British battleships and the location of their scout aircraft. As far as the Americans were concerned, having the aircraft amidships meant vulnerability because both the aircraft fuel itself uh, and the aircraft were quite flammable and so they were worried that if the ship took a hit amidships, which ultimately is where roughly most ships tended to be hit in gun duels, you could send suddenly end up with a lot of unnecessary burning going on, which is very bad. And actually, at the first battle of Savo Island, this does happen to a number of U.S. cruisers, which is a bit unfortunate. The main fuel tanks for the aircraft were deeper in the ship, more protected, but the aircraft themselves would obviously have fuel on board. There might be some ready-use fuel around, depending on where, how careful the crew had been, and obviously there were fuel feed lines. So by moving all of that astern, you didn't technically get rid of the problem of burning fuel, but at least it was confined to the stern, which was a lot easier to deal with than amidships. The other thing was that the American practice, when you look at the a lot of the interwar American ships, it was for big trainable catapults with the aircraft perched atop of them. And this, the Americans felt, was getting in the way of their ability to put more guns on the uh, ship amidships. So the secondary battery and anti-aircraft guns and then later on as obviously dual purpose guns came in the secondary battery as well as fire directors and all the other things you need associated with that and again if you move the aircraft off to the stern then you have more space to put more guns in the middle whereas the other way around you either have to lengthen the overall uh, dimensions of the superstructure amidships to fit the similar number of guns in or you do make sure do with less guns or you end up putting guns fore and aft which is slightly less than ideal because although they have very good fields of fire they also take a lot longer to get to and from and as we've discussed before they do cause issues with the main battery whereas on the British side of things they went for full hangars amidships which obviously does shelter the aircraft somewhat they the hangars were also more about preserving the aircraft because if you have the aircraft sitting on the stern which some u.s ships did have to do then if you were in places like the north sea and the atlantic chances were that aircraft was going to get very badly battered and worn by sp spray and waves very quickly so it would very quickly become inoperable whereas sitting in an amidships hangar they'd stay nice and dry and easy to maintain the other thing was that the royal navy at least by the time we're talking about uh, the, the, where we're talking about the contrast on the fast battleships was going for the amidships athwart catapult system which was a fixed catapult system built into the deck 
which had rails moving the aircraft to and from the hangar as well. And the idea of this was to lessen the overall weight in the ship because a trainable catapult obviously has to sit above the deck. It's got the training motor, etc. So it's a more it's a heavier piece of equipment. And it also requires additional cranes because you are going to have to obviously take the aircraft off the catapult occasionally for maintenance or if you're as long as you're carrying more aircraft than you have catapults, you're going to have others that need to be put on. So you need an aircraft that can move uh, sorry, you need a crane that can move the aircraft to the catapult, but you also need another crane that can recover the aircraft from the ocean because that those two locations may not be the same. Whereas with a fixed catapult built into the deck, you only need the one crane to lift the aircraft out of the water. Now, weight-wise overall, I think it actually ended up, because of the extra rail systems and a few other issues, you actually like the fact that a thought uh, deck catapult is actually slightly longer than most of the trainable ones you actually ended up with the systems weighing about the same there wasn't that much of a difference in weight but because all of the catapult systems for the royal navy system were built into the deck they were lower by six eight ten feet sometimes more than the american trainable ones which meant that even if the mass was approximately the same the effect on stability was less so there were good reasons for both sides to go with the arrangements that they actually came up with um the <laughs> although it's not quite something that they could have foreseen at the time but in some ways the amidships catapults did mean that the royal navy had a little bit more room for modernization and expansion later on because if you take off the stern catapults on a US fast battleship, then all you can really do with the saved space is put a couple of 40mm or 20mm gun mounts on the stern, whereas in some of the later British ships, if you take out the hangar and you take out the thought deck catapult and its associated cranes etc you've actually freed up a fair amount of space amidships which can be used for all sorts of things including extra guns so whether that, that in terms of modernization although obviously they couldn't have anticipated at the time they were putting the measures in you've got more room for modernization and upgrades on a british ship the flip side of course being that you may have slightly less space in you may have had slightly less space in the first place so depending on the exact length of your amidships uh, area, you may just be playing catch-up. Steve Valley asks, What was the first class of light crews that have multiple gun turrets like the Leander class did? By design, it was supposed to have been the German Emden cruiser. Uh, that I was about to say SMS Emden, but that's kind of, that's the... SMS Emden of World War I. I'm talking about the Emden that was built in the early 1920s. It was supposed to have four twin turrets, but the Allies after Versailles said no, and it ended up with the same armament of eight guns, but in eight single turrets. As a result, the first light cruiser to mount a twin turret was, as you mentioned the in the rest of the question, the Omaha class. This would be followed only much later on by things like the Megamis with the triple turrets, the Leanders obviously with the twins, although there was one cruiser that predated that um, outside of the Omaha's and in the light cruiser terms, and that was HMS Enterprise, which wasn't initially built with a twin turret, but did carry a twin turret later on in life in the early, very early 1930s as an experimental uh, te technology and it was that precise twin turret that would go on to be adopted for the Leanders and the Arath users. As Steve also mentions in the rest of his question, larger cruisers like armoured cruisers and even some of the bigger protected cruisers had already had twin turrets for a very long time. Obviously Olympia, all the way back in the uh, late 1800s, had twin 8-inch turrets, but historically the twin turret had been the domain of the larger gun, so 7.5, 9.2, 8 inch and and above had had various iterations of twin mountings fitted to them, but the quick firing nature of the smaller guns had meant they'd stayed in single mounts for a lot lot longer, because although there were certain advantages to having a twin turret, 
as was proven with the case of Enterprise and indeed on the Omaha's, you could fit two guns in a single turret in less space than you needed to fit two single guns. It did have an effect on the rate of fire and it was only with advances in technology in the 20s and the 30s that allowed the rate of fire of a twin turret to begin to approach something like the rate of fire of a single mount that it then became possible to justify putting twin and indeed later triple six inch turrets on light cruisers because at that point whilst the rate of fire was still slightly lower it wasn't so much lower that it offset the advantages in space and protection that you could get with a twin. Mug Gum asks, which navy had the first Enterprise, the USA or Britain? So this is a prize that's quite easily won by the Royal Navy, mostly on the grounds of the fact the Royal Navy was around for several hundred years before the USA was around as a country. The One of the earliest recorded HMS Enterprises is from the early 1700s, and for those of you who watched the Star Trek series Enterprise, you'll note that they actually acknowledge technically well not necessarily that particular ship but they do acknowledge the or origins of hms enterprises the ship bearing the name uh, in the introductory sequence now that's when you look, then look at the u.s navy america had a uss enterprise quite early um, there were a couple of USS Enterprises as part of the Continental Navy, even technically before the United States Navy was a thing. So both nations have a fairly long history of having a ship named Enterprise in their service, although, of course, uh, CV-6 and uh, CVN-65 have rather taken the spotlight um, of late. Alan6832 asks, to what extent did larger classes benefit from cost savings due to mass production? And might this have helped them to gang up on larger ships like Graf Spee? How many Leanders would it have taken to beat Bismarck? Would that number of Leanders have cost more than Bismarck? Would they weigh more? Would they have more crew? So larger classes do benefit from cost savings, although it is on a gradually decreasing scale. If you build a one-off ship, that's the most expensive as you build three, four, up to half a dozen, the cost per ship starts to drop off quite dramatically. Once you've got up past about a dozen or so, there's not a tremendous drop off beyond that, although there still is some. And there's two main aspects to it, one of which is that developing a new class of ship always involves a program cost, research and development cost. You're having to at the very minimum, design a new hull and power plant, even if you're reusing existing weaponry. And so that cost isn't associated with any individual ship, but it's associated with the entire program. And then you've got the cost of building the ships themselves. So let's say in the 1930s it cost you £2 million to design a ship. Then if you can build each of those ships for a £1 million pounds for the actual hull machinery weapons etc if you only build one then it's cost you three million if you build two it's cost you four million and so if you then do the division you work out well one ship it's three million per ship two ships it's only two million per ship and then so on and so forth so if you built um, four ships and it's cost you six million then it's it's only costing you one and a half million per ship but then if you build eight, costing you 10 million, it's costing you 1.25 uh, million per ship. So you can see in terms of the, dividing the program cost, the reductions in overall unit cost actually decrease fairly rapidly. The other way that you save cost with large ship production is that you often get a discount on bulk order of machinery. Um, or And machinery in this sense could mean the engines themselves, it can mean the guns, the hoists, the, basically anything that really moves, as well as also discounts on bulk orders that you just tend to get in all sorts of industry because it's cheaper to produce a large number of things because if you're producing new things, that usually means new tools, new jigs, etc., etc. And those are subject at the manufacturer's end to pretty much exactly the same economies of scale when it comes to the investment they have to make to make the tools and then they sell you the individual items so you your price of materials and price of equipment will drop with the 
the larger and larger class that you make so in those two those are the two main areas you'll see cost savings in mass production now how that affects the leanders well they started off in the beginning of their production run costing about 1.6 million per ship uh, including program costs that obviously did drop off as the latter units were built but let's for a conservative argument use 1.6 million now the Deutschland class depending on which one you're looking at cost between 80 and 90 million Reichsmark around about the same time the Reichsmark to pound exchange rate was about 20 and a half Reichsmarks to the pound which depending on exactly which Deutschland class you go for gives you about two and a half to two and three quarter Leanders to a single Deutschland so bearing in mind we're using a very conservative price for the Leanders you can probably round that to about three Leanders for a Deutschland and well th that's effectively the force that fought the Graf Spee except that you'd be removing Axter and replacing her with a third Leander whether or not three Leanders could have beaten Graf Spee in a straight up fight between their speed and torpedo armament and the fact that that many six inch guns could properly mess up anything outside of Graf Spee's main armor it's possible but given how well Graf Spee endured the uh, battering it took at the hands of Ajax Achilles and Exeter and Exeter's eight inch guns obviously doing a fair amount of damage in and of themselves meh, I'd, I'd be I, I wouldn't be the world's happiest Commodore if I was taking three Leanders up against Graf Spee. I'd, I'd certainly much prefer to have at least uh, Exeter or better still a county class on my side. But when it comes to the Bismarck class, they, well there's two ships, they average about around about 190 million Reichsmark to the pound, but at the same time when they're being built the exchange rate's fallen to about 12-ish Reichsmarks to the pound. And of course they're built in the late 1930s so you have to adjust the Leander's overall price tag for inflation but it gives you around, depending on which inflation figures you use, whether you take the figure for Bismarck or Tirpitz and exactly what exchange rate you use, whether you use the, sort of the exchange rate from 1936, 1938, 1939 etc. It gives you somewhere between 9 and 10 Leander class for the price of a single Bismarck. Now in terms of displacement that's about 80,000 tons of cruiser, um, if you're going, say, with 10, because it's an easier multiplier. Um, and you're looking at about 5,500 to 6,000 crew, so you're talking about two to two and a half times the crew of Bismarck, about just, um, just under twice the displacement of Bismarck for the same money. But at the same time, um, 10 Leander class, I think with 10 Leander class you're almost certain to beat Bismarck, mainly because you can just go into line abreast. I mean the 6 inch guns, yes, you're never going to dent Bismarck's uh, main armour, or indeed some of its uh, more distributed armour. But you can, you, I mean, you can tear up the decks and stuff, however the main thing would be I'd just if I was in charge of 10 Leanders versus the Bismarck, just go bow in and charge. Bismarck can't kill enough of them fast enough before they get in range, especially if they launch a night attack. And once they get close enough, that's an awful lot of torpedoes. Um, so, yeah. Josh Barnes asks, Looking at what many Allied cr light cruisers were able to get up to during the war and the successes they were able to achieve, I've wondered why it seems none of the Axis navies really bothered to build them and instead just built lots of heavy cruisers. Is this because of a pay-per-view of heavy cruiser beats light cruiser or was there a tactical dash strategic reason for the foregoing of light cruisers by the Axis? The funny thing is there actually were a fair number of Axis light cruisers. Now, fair enough, they didn't quite have the same ratio of light cruiser to heavy cruiser that the Allies did, but there were still a fair number of them. The main problem when it comes to Axis light cruisers is, in some cases, their design and in other cases, their role. For, let's say, the Kriegsmarine, Whilst they technically actually had slightly more light cruisers than they had heavy cruisers, the simple fact was that the Admiral Hipper class and the Deutschland class were able to go places and do things. The Königsbergs and the Leipzigs, and well, to a, uh, for different reasons, the Emden, 
couldn't. Um, the German light cruisers were basically good for work in the Baltic, and that was about it. Uh, they were just far too lightly built. They tried to use them in Norway, and they got a couple of them quite badly clobbered as a result, which put their numbers down even further. So after Norway, you really don't see all that much about the German light cruisers. And because you do hear about the Hippers and the Deutschlands, that gives the impression that the, the Germans pretty much only had them. Um, which, I mean, for strategic purposes on the high seas, yeah, they pretty much did. Um, the Italians actually had quite a number of light cruisers. Now, exactly how many depends on if you count some of their uh, condottieri class as, well, the group of classes that make up the condottieris as light cruisers or especially overblown destroyers. But either way, they actually had a more light cruisers than they had heavies. The heavies, they actually only had two Trentos, four Zaras, and obviously um, after Matapan only one, and uh, Bolzano, and that's it. There were, a, there were a lot more light cruisers. However, again, with the Italians, we know about the Italian heavy cruisers mostly because of Matapan in the Western world, and in the uh, they were still around for a lot of other battles, but because they were light cruisers, they were a little bit faster, and to be perfectly honest, a little bit more expendable. They tended to get used in smaller actions like sweeps, um, convoy escort sometimes, and that sort of activity. And as a result, if you use a relatively lightly built ship, and bear in mind a lot of the Italian light cruisers were not Brooklyn Megami town style 10,000 ton cruisers. They were in the five to 7,000 tons of Arethusa to Leander style displacement range. And when you're using relatively small ships like that at a fairly high operational tempo in what, after all, is fairly dangerous uh, environments, they get sunk pretty quickly. And given that Italy's only in the war for just about three years, they don't get too much known about them. Um, although a surprising number of them do get do actually survive and get to serve either in the Italian Navy or other navies until quite a significant amount of time after the First World War, but there's obviously a very, very quick glut of casualties in 1940 and 1941. And as far as the Japanese are concerned, well, the Japanese did buy into the heavy cruiser in a big way. They, they kind of stopped making <laughs> light cruisers, generally speaking, in the 1920s and shifted over to heavy cruiser production. Of course, they made the Megamis as light cruisers, switched them over to heavy cruisers before the war kicked off. So they had quite a heavy cruiser um, balanced fleet, and that's because, as I've discussed in the video on Japanese naval strategy, they were looking at attacks on a heavy cruiser line, heavy cruiser fleet screen of the US Navy, and then attacks on the American battleships themselves, which generally require a heavier ship. The light cruisers that they had, therefore, were in the majority these smaller, older, early to mid-1920s designs, which were significantly less capable, and the Japanese recognised that they were less capable, and so again, they generally got shuffled off to second-line duties, so when you see the really big actions that the Japanese are part of, obviously the big carrier battles and a number of the Guadalcanal campaign battles, etc. It's mostly heavy cruisers, even if it's the older ones. You do see a few of the light, older light cruisers pop up here and there, but again, because they're smaller, lighter, not as heavily armed, certainly in terms of anti-aircraft batteries, they tend to get knocked out a lot, lot easier than the heavy cruisers. And so, again, you, you start to lo lose track of, of them, even in the secondary theatres, relatively quickly and they just then don't get the big ticket headlines. And a small part of it, to be perfectly honest, is due to industrial capacity. All three Axis nations had plans for new light cruiser classes in reasonable size numbers, but they were all looking to build them 1939 through 1942 on the basis that it takes a long time to build a capital ship, less time to build a heavy cruiser, less time to build a light cruiser, less time to build a destroyer. And so with their limited amount of industry, 
they were trying to get the big heavy stuff out first and then in what they thought would be the run-up to an actual war in the early 1940s quickly get the lighter stuff out except the war started too early for pretty much everyone and they were then stuck with this slight imbalance if you look at the lot so the very biggest navies of heavy cruisers versus light and a lot of their light cruisers therefore obviously then being older and more obsolete units whereas the US Navy and the Royal Navy because they had that much larger industrial base behind them and in the Royal Navy's case also had a very large empire to protect they were able to build heavy cruisers and light cruisers either simultaneously or in the British case actually with a strong preference towards light cruisers which meant that a lot of the light cruiser stocks of those two navies were considerably more modern and therefore could be used and hazarded in much more difficult and therefore more notable situations. Screezilla asks, was there a reason the Great White Fleet didn't stop off at England, France or Germany? You'd think the fleet would also want to flex at those nations as well? In theory, yes. However, the voyage of the Great White Fleet, as you mentioned, is, is very a, v much a political statement of sort of look at us we're here we're 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 on the world scene and at the point at which the great white fleet is assembling at gibraltar and about to head out into the atlantic it's been a fairly big success they've been the biggest formation of battleships flying a single flag that any that has been seen in any of the seas that they've been voyaging through uh, because while you do have the British Mediterranean fleet and you've got obviously the entire Italian fleet, the entire Ottoman fleet, etc. running around the Mediterranean and some of the French fleet collectively obviously outnumbering the Great White Fleet but all under different flags. And the same applies with, with the Japanese fleet, etc. etc. So it serves great propaganda purposes for the 16 battleships the great white fleet to be around in those areas however if you're going to go to visit the french ports in the atlantic or the english channel any of the german ports or indeed any of the british ports you're almost certainly going to be either sailing through or very near the english channel and you're certainly going to be near the uk coastline and that means you're putting a large formation of battleships close to British home territory. And whilst the British aren't afraid of war with the United States, they can't possibly be shown up off their own doorstep. And at that point, um, in the latter part of the Great White Fleet's voyage, the Royal Navy had two large fleets, not including the reserves, which they could have activated, but the two large fleets they had in the area were the Atlantic Fleet and the Channel Fleet. And if you just add up the active in-service battleships in the Channel and Atlantic Fleets for that period, you notice that those two fleets alone, and bear in mind, as I said, you still have the Mediterranean Fleet, you still have the Far East Squadron and all the other squadrons all over the place, which have other battleships in the Royal Navy, but just those two local fleets outnumber the Great White Fleet quite considerably. And on top of that, obviously, you have HMS Dreadnought and some of the early Bellerophons in service. So having had this great success run so far, the last thing the US Navy wanted to do was to undermine their own success and their own sort of propaganda triumph with photos splashed in all of the newspapers of the mighty great white fleet effectively double flanked by royal navy warships including several dreadnoughts which of course the u.s didn't have at that point at least in the great white fleet um the south carolina's uh, just about being coming into the fleet at the time that would sort of deflate the balloon quite considerably and so, very wisely, they chose not to do so. And the position would have been further undermined, you can bet, by the press, because not only would the press have pointed out that here's the Great White Fleet being horrifically outnumbered, but they also would have certainly played up on the fact that here's the Great White Fleet, which represents the majority of the US's battle fleet at the time, greatly outnumbered by a portion of the Royal Navy. And 
even if the, the Great White Fleet hadn't been heading for British ports, going up the English Channel would have provoked that response, whether they were heading for French ports, German ports, or British ports, or Scandinavian ports, or any other ports in that vicinity. And so, yeah, it basically comes down to a matter of PR. Arctic Temper asks, how would the war at sea be different had World War I broken out over the Bosnian crisis in 1908? It would have looked very, very different. In large part, I mean, if we're assuming that the Bosnian crisis sort of goes as historically runs through 1908 and into early 1909, and then um, sort of everything breaks down instead of de-escalating and you end up with a war being declared in sort of spring 1909, I'm not going to come in on the land side because I don't know anything close to enough about that. But on the naval side of things, it would basically be the battle, the last battle of the pre-Dreadnought era navies. Because practically nobody has any Dreadnoughts or battle cruisers, etc. However, the situation in that respect actually, it favours the Royal Navy an awful lot more. Because submarine technology... There's a huge jump in the six years between 1908 and 1914. And similarly with mine laying and such, and torpedoes as well. There's a huge jump in capability. And so most of those concerns wouldn't be around quite as much. I mean, they'd still be around. Submarines exist. Um, but but they wouldn't have quite the same impact in a 1908-1909 war as they would in a 1914 to 1918 war. Because it's going to be basically a war of pre-dreadnoughts, that actually, as I say, hands the Royal Navy a colossal advantage because it has by far the most pre-dreadnoughts of anybody. Um, both all the way back, going all the way back to things like the Majestic class, but also coming close to the time with things like the King Edward VII. The Royal Navy is just spitting out pre-dreadnoughts at a ridiculous rate. And on top of all of that, the Royal Navy would be entering the war as the only navy with the new Dreadnought-type warships. Admittedly, not many. Dreadnought herself would be in commission. The Bellerophons would be just about coming into commission around about the same time that the war breaks out. And the St. Vincent's historically don't commission until 1910, so you're looking at, if we're being optimistic, well, by the time the war's got properly stuck in for Dreadnought, type battleships the invincibles are also just about coming in so in terms of the fleet screen you're looking at protected cruisers and armored cruisers and the british then are sitting there with the only battle cruisers so un quite unlike uh, jutland in 1916 any theoretical similar engagement in 1908-1909 the invincibles are going to be sitting there pretty much in the similar kind of situation that they were in in the Falklands, where they can outrun and outgun anything that the Germans have. And obviously in that particular situation, you'd have things like the, the Minotaurs, Warrior, Defence, etc., the, the last generation British armoured cruisers following along, and the Germans having various armoured cruisers to try and oppose them, um, which probably isn't going to end well for the Germans. So, yeah, it would it would mean the Royal Navy could play a lot more aggressively, and in a single fleet action, the Royal Navy has a massive advantage. The Germans would probably, as the war develops throughout 1909, begin to bring the Nassaus, uh, or at least the first of them, online. But they, 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 this will be, sort of, as the war is getting a bit further on, and... I suspect the British will probably accelerate bringing in the St. Vincent's in response. So, yeah. <laughs> Although the British do have a lot more cards at this point, and obviously the French fleet with its various pre-dreadnoughts is uh, somewhat more relevant than they were in the his war World War One historically with a limited number of not-so-capable dreadnoughts, there, there is the flip side to that, which is that with the numbers advantage so clearly heavily weighted in favour of the British, the Germans are much, much, much more likely to just go turtle and try and stay in harbour as much as possible until they can at least get the Nassaus online, because even if you only get the Nassaus online, 
having four dreadnoughts to match the British four and possibly with the St. Vincent's uh, some additional ones at that point probably brought in, but maybe being outnumbered around 1.75 or 2 to 1 is considerably better than being outnumbered infinite to 1 in dreadnoughts. Um, and of course uh, the, the effectiveness of both sides dreadnoughts against the pre-dreadnoughts is going to be quite considerable. Santiago Trujillo Tobon asks, the cleaning of the coal dust on pre-dreadnoughts, was it really to prevent a fire hazard? <laughs> or is that just a reference to Tsushima? So it is genuinely to prevent a fire hazard is the short answer. So slightly longer answer involves a little bit of uh, physics. Basically, if you have something that's theoretically flammable, it may be and I hate to use the word inflammable because it means both not flammable and flammable depending on the language and the context you're using it in but I'll just use not flammable, it makes it easier so a particular element, compound, material, whatever you want to uh, use it may be not flammable in a certain state uh, i.e. liquid or solid or it may be very hard to make burn in those states. But one of obviously you've got the fire tri triangle of oxygen, heat, and fuel source. But there is another factor which is involved, which is surface area. If the surface area of your fuel, relative to its volume, is very great, then the ease of combustion increases massively. And that can make things that you normally wouldn't think of as being flammable very, very flammable, and in fact explosive, um, because it's much easier to set them on fire in the first place, and when they do catch fire, it spreads very, very quickly, and ultimately, at the end of the day, in a lot of these things, uh, what we see as an explosion is in fact just a very, very fast burn, usually in an, in an enclosed environment. So this is why, and obviously, do not try any of this at home, um, leave that to either the professionals or the insane people like me um, but if you say take petrol you, you can in theory put a cigarette stub out in a bucket of petrol but if you this is why they have the no smoking signs at petrol stations if you have petrol vapour because it is now aerosolized and is present in lots of small particles instead of as a single uh, liquid entity now it can burn and be very, very explosive. Um, similarly with things like paraffin, relatively difficult to get to burn as a liquid. Very easy to get to burn once aerosolized. Very good for fire breathing. Um, that, that's, that's one of the things I actually do. So, um, yeah, learn that very quickly. Then when, you've also got things like, say, flour. Now, if you just get a bag of flour and you get a match and you stick a match in a bag of flour, it's going to go out and you've ruined a small amount of your flour same thing with say drinking chocolate powder but if you throw a bunch of it up into the air and it just drifts down as a cloud yeah then 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 it will burn and uh, quite spectacularly too this is why you get things like um uh silos grain even grain can do this but grain silos flour silos silos full of various forms of things like chocolate powder they can just randomly explode um it's not necessarily entirely random but in those in a lot of those cases it's caused by static that's built up discharging the static sets off a very very tiny amount of combustion and then that spreads very rapidly and boom so what's all that got to do with coal well coal as you know can be burned and that's why it's on the ship as a fuel source in the first place if you then have coal dust and that's incredibly dangerous because that will burn very, very easily. Coal dust explosions are a major hazard in coal mines, for example. Uh, there's a lot of hazards in coal mines, but coal dust explosions are one of them. And so it doesn't do very good things to your lungs either to breathe in. So if you have coal dust aboard your ship, you're going to be ruining the health of your crew. Um, it's going to make an absolute mess of your ship. And coal dust in enclosed environments, like, say, in the corridors and in the various compartments of your ship, that's just inviting an explosion at, um, at any given time. And as I said, because coal dust 
is very very fine powder it means that if it coats anything that gets set on fire by any other kind of means like say enemy incoming enemy shell fire it will burn very quickly and even though the stuff that it's sitting on might not have burned from that flash um, of explosion the fact that the coal dust will burn obviously for longer means the heat is present for longer and therefore things like say paint that at a certain blast rate at a certain distance from the initial blast might not have set on fire if the coal dust burns for a few seconds will then start to melt and burn which is bad so yeah coal dust incredibly dangerous fire hazard as are to be honest almost all forms of dust um that's why i think things like this need to be kept very very clean captain landlocked asks when was the threat of an invasion of britain most credible since the defeat of the spanish armada there have been a few times um well one of the things that a lot of people tend to forget is that actually Britain was invaded after the Spanish Armada, not immediately after the Spanish Armada, but in what the so-called Glorious Revolution towards the end of the 1600s, when William um, of Orange came over to depose uh, James II. So that was, uh, yeah, that was definitely um, a seaborne invasion, albeit that a large portion of the British populace and more relevantly the aristocracy at the time kind of invited them over so the Royal Navy didn't really engage they either stood down or in a lot of cases actually escorted William in so a lot of people te so technically doesn't count because we asked them to come here um, so is it an invasion if you ask them to to land I don't know um, beyond that um, if you think of the various wars that Britain was involved with, and there's a lot of them, um, the Anglo-Dutch wars, there wasn't so much of a risk of invasion. There were some of the Anglo-Dutch wars certainly ended in, with the, the Dutch having control of most of the seas around Britain, but Britain still had a fairly substantial navy, and more to the point the Dutch didn't have the army or the transport fleet to really pull off a successful invasion of Britain. So from a very, very tactical perspective of could somebody have invaded, technically yes, uh, especially after the raid on the Medway. However, the people who were actually un undergoing hostilities with Britain at the time didn't have the capability to do it, so strategically no. Um, so the in in terms of the single biggest threat of invasion after the Spanish Armada, I'd probably actually say Napoleon. Um, the it's, the threat was certainly taken very seriously. Now I'm not going to rehash Operation Sea Lion for yet another time, but it was that was certainly much less of a plausible situation than Napoleon's invasion. Um, you've World War One, no, it just was not not going to happen. There were plenty of invasion scares in the nineteenth century, but again, the Royal Navy had a very large force available to stop whoever wanted to. But in the Napoleonic times, um, Napoleon obviously had this saying of sort of give him mastery of the Channel for I think it was a week, and he'd be able to take he'd be master of the world because he'd be able to conquer Britain. He wasn't entirely wrong. Um, he had enough troops on his side of things, on, on the French coast, to certainly probably conduct a fairly successful invasion. And it was in that period of... You could pull off the invasion using the ships that you had. Sort of, there, there wasn't it. What you weren't quite in the era of fully dedicated troop transports, but you were also a bit past the era of um just any old ship will do so yeah but if napoleon had got control full control of the channel at the time that he wanted to he probably could have pulled off a fairly successful invasion whether or not that would have then gone on to actually fully succeed if if the royal navy say came back from wherever it had gone off to and then cut his communications and supply lines across the channel is another matter but Certainly that was probably the most credible threat of invasion um, where Britain didn't actually want them to come over.
between the time of the Spanish Armada and today. Nickboy302 asks, given the Royal Navy and Royal Australian Navy's practice of recruiting boy seamen, what purpose did the Australian Navy Cadets-Sea Cadet Corps serve as far as their parent navies were concerned? Well, if we're speaking in purely practical terms, outside of the sort of the social benefits and such that um, such organisations are said to have, um, when you're looking at the Sea Cadets of various nations, you tend to see the rise of these organisations around about the same kind of time as navies stop recruiting from very, very, very young ages. So, I mean, obviously with the things like the Australian Navy cadets, that comes in, they come in a bit later, but that's because the Royal Australian Navy doesn't exist until somewhat further down the line. Um, but with, certainly with the Sea Cadet Corps, the idea is that now that you say can't take a 10 year old to sea you can at least start training them and this gives you two benefits one is obviously by the time they get old enough whatever old enough happens to be at any given time it could be 14 it could be 16 it could be 18 um depending on the time period in the 20th century and in the late 19th then they will hopefully have a certain number of skills and a certain idea of how it, everything is supposed to work, which in turn will mean that it's much easier to train and integrate them into the Navy, for, so you don't have to start from scratch if you like. Secondly, it gives you a fairly fertile recruiting ground, because if somebody has joined the Sea Cadets or equivalent organisation, and they've stuck around in it until the point where they reach an age where they can apply to join the Navy, chances are they're probably fairly committed to that career and they're going to run with it as opposed to again if you just recruit any number of 10 12 14 etc year olds there you're going to have a much higher washout rate from that than people who've already been through a certain element of naval life and decided they actually rather like it or at least can put up with it so it, it helps minimize wastage in terms of your, your training it helps accelerate your training and it also helps improve the Navy's image in the community because um, obviously it, it means young people, hey, young people have a thing to, things to do so they're not running around breaking and stealing things um, as a lot of young, young boys are wont to do. But also obviously it, fr from the community perspective they think, oh yes, yeah, so the, the Navy is reaching out, it's helping the youngsters, it's giving them a potential future career. Uh, etc which indeed it, they most likely are and um, yeah so it, it's a combination of good PR and also assists with uh, recruiting and training costs quite substantially for the navies in question and it also means you get kind of you get in there first because you don't let's be honest you don't see that many accountancy and stockbroker firms setting up like wall street cadets or something for 10 year olds to learn how to do stock trading so get in early get the best and leave uh, everyone else to, to join other trades and organizations jack andrew hunter asks reading on the naval aspects of the normandy landings there seem to be very little written for any planned contingencies of what could have been potential hiccups were there any plans made with the intention of reinforcing a somewhat successful invasion or salvaging a disastrous one there really weren't any sort of plan Bs for if D-Day had gone horribly wrong. Um, if the landings had struggled and maybe hadn't made the kind of advances the Allies really wanted to, and historically they didn't quite manage that in a lot of places, the Allies' plan was pretty simple, if somewhat Zap Brannigan-esque, throw in more men. Because if the landings were partially successful, the logic went, well, if you put more men, more equipment and more tanks into the field, well, then you will gradually overwhelm the Germans. And once you've got your bridgehead sorted out, then you're good to go. Or beachheads, I suppose, at that point. Um, in terms of if things had gone so horribly wrong that you had to pull the troops back, the Allies had planned the timing of it and even moved the date to accommodate for the weather and ensure that they had enough men, enough equipment, enough gunfire support from the ships, etc., that, as far as they were concerned, they had the overwhelming force necessary to make it a success, regardless of what the Germans could realistically throw at them. There is some reference in a few 
um, papers such as a letter that Eisenhower prepared ahead of time just in case it all failed, which talk about withdrawing the troops, but as far as I know, and because this is to a certain extent a land operation, I don't have quite as much um, in-depth knowledge of what the army was planning um, as opposed to the naval side of things, but a withdrawal plan doesn't seem to have existed in a particularly concrete manner. Apart from anything else, you really couldn't predict where it would fail. Would it fail all over? Would it be one beach that failed and needed withdrawing? Or would it? Would you just have to put reinforcements into other beaches to try and sort of pincer around? All that kind of stuff. And given the sheer scale of the invasion, for it to be an outright failure from the very start, start was pretty much not going to happen. If it everything was going to go so badly that they were going to have to withdraw troops again because of the sheer numbers involved it would take several days for that to become apparent and so you would end up with those days to sort of prepare and refine exactly how you were going to do it and again it, it would have been still very much a case of what how has it failed if the if it's unusually strong german shore defenses that are still intact or is it just that the passages out of the beach are just too clogged or is it that the, the there's unexpected conditions or defenses on the beaches themselves all of these things would affect how you would actually try and withdraw or relocate troops because different types of landing craft would be at different stages of vulnerability depending on that circumstance Lewis Maskell asks, do you have any book recommendations in English for pre-dreadnoughts of the continental powers, i.e. Germany, Russia, France, Austria, Italy, etc, etc? Okay, I'm not going to put individual pictures of the books up because it's just going to end up looking like a very rapid slideshow, but for French pre-dreadnoughts, and yeah, well, if I've got to live with the, the fact they existed, you can suffer through the picture for five minutes. Um... <laughs> I would recommend French Battleships of World War I um, by John Jordan and uh, Philippe Caresse. Um, it's a very good um, source just to look over the whole um, sort of paradigm of French pre-dreadnought construction um, and is, unlike a lot of other books that cover that particular field, actually available at a decent price. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a good place to start. For Russian battleships, um, I'd recommend the, the one of the best books, which is um, Russian and Soviet Battleships by Stephen McLaughlin. The only downside to that, although it does come highly recommended by me, is the blasted thing is insanely expensive at the moment. Um, so, yeah, good luck finding a decent price copy, but watch this space. There may be developments on that in the near future. When it comes to German pre-dreadnoughts, the Kaiser's Battlefleet by Aidan Dodson is uh, relatively good. It's not got quite as much detail on the pre-dreadnoughts as I'd necessarily like, but it's a pretty decent um, book on the on the the Kaiserliche Marine generally. You of course have uh, Conway's All the World's Fighting Ships, eighteen sixty something to nineteen o five. That'll cover everything but obviously not in the world's greatest levels of detail. If you can get hold of it, there's a book called Austro-Hungarian Battleships of World War I by Zvonimir Freivogel, I think. Um, there's an English-language version, there's a dual-language version as well, but it's very difficult to get hold of. And similarly, there's a book, Italian Warships of World War I. Again, pretty decent coverage of the Italian uh, pre-dreadnought fleet. Difficult to get hold of. I'm going off of uh, books that either I've read or I've oh or I own. Yeah, basic ones I've had access to and and have been able to check out or ones that I've owned or own at the moment. Um, if anyone has any other suggestions, particularly for the Italian, Austro-Hungarian, and maybe for the German ones as well, uh, do drop a comment in the comments below because I'm always interested in picking up new and better books about that horribly underwritten about period. Vinve asks, when Royal Navy warships were scrapped en masse after World War One and World War Two, what happened to the ship's boats? Were they sold off, chopped up for firewood? Do some still exist in civilian use? There were a whole range of fates. Um, quite often, when ships were scrapped, even en masse, the boats would just be taken off and uh, 
analyzed and a lot of them would be reused so if you had boats that were in good condition on a ship that was going to be scrapped they'd be held back and either used for training purposes uh, for general harbour work or immediately put on to other ships that were still in service that needed boats because maybe their own boats had had an accident or rotted out or whatever so a good portion of them were recycled back into the navy some of them that were older models or worn out rotten etc would be condemned and a few were sold off i mean it the thing is when it comes to ships boats you can have everything from a relatively small rowboat as can you can see here in the picture all the way up to steam powered well i hate to use the word pinnances but whether you call them a cutter a gig or whatever effectively some of these could be fairly substantial craft in and of themselves and yeah, some of those were sold on um, I certainly know that I've seen over the years in some in some museums and even in some uh, marinas there's sort of either bits of a boat or a whole boat itself and it's like yeah, this boat came from it, this and this warship these days obviously most of the survivors from World War II, ex World War Two warships um, but the amount that was sold off into civilian use is relatively slim um, and then obviously over time they would would decay wear out get discarded etc so whilst i do know that there are one or two ships boats um that were then sold off and are still around in civilian use i don't think there's going to be many more than that um and the the what certainly the one or two that i've seen tend to be in kind of the mid-range they're not the full-sized steam launches but they're also not not rowboats they're kind of effectively they're used these days for like sm small harbor work and small cruises around harbours and things like that nothing nothing particularly major Loch Ness Hamster asks during the Korean War USS Wisconsin took a hit from a shore-based artillery piece are there any examples of ships being sunk or heavily damaged by field artillery or other weapons not designed to shoot at ships D damaged yes sunk not so much um the the thing is, when it comes to field artillery and as you say, other weapons are not really designed to shoot at ships, they're generally too small. Um, I, we, I've discussed this in a previous dry dock, why land-based artillery outside of rail guns and uh, as in guns mounted on railway tracks and the odd bit of siege artillery generally tends to be considerably smaller and usually less powerful than shipborne artillery basically comes down to the fact you've got an entire ship to move around a ship's guns it's not quite as easy to move an 8 10 or 12 inch gun around on the land um, but it, effectively it means that your average piece of field artillery whether that be an 88 a, yeah an 88 105 millimeter maybe even 120 millimeter very rarely a 152 normally just don't have the firepower to do anything particularly significant unless your target is a insanely close or b very small uh, there's a reason hms amethyst is up here because obviously hms amethyst did take something of a pasting as did a number of other destroyers and other ships that came to try and help or rescue it um, from chinese field batteries on a river um, and obviously hms amethyst is a sloop so the fact that it lost out to mass field artillery fires not necessarily quite as impressive but the cruiser hms london did come up to try and relieve it at some point uh during the crisis and did end up falling back not because it was heavily damaged but because the amount of damage it was accumulating on its upper works from point blank field battery fire was um held to be probably a bit counterproductive to the overall aim but so yeah damage yes yeah, certainly sinking is is much more difficult the about the closest you're going to find to field artillery and other weapons not designed to uh, actually shoot at ships just kind of completely out there and in the field engaging and actually causing critical damage is probably gonna you're probably your best bet is either to look at one of the tribal class that was hit off of North Africa. Um, it was hit by Italian coastal batteries, which did a fair bit of damage, but it was also hit by German 88mm field guns that decided to operate in a coastal defence role that day. 
and one or two of the 88mm shells did do some pretty nasty damage, which contributed quite heavily to the sinking. So, I mean, that's a. This is the thing. A lot of the time, when you get these kind of improvised defenses, they are combining with dedicated field defenses. So, um, yeah, <laughs> exactly who's responsible for the sinking can be a bit unclear there. The the one that always sticks out in my mind uh, for certain, and is actually something like some point I need to think about asking the chieftain to do a collaboration on, is when a bunch of tanks wound up engaging some light coastal German uh, warships during the uh, liberation of France, and one, they managed to sink, sink and heavily damage a number of uh, German coastal ships, albeit whilst they were tied up in harbour, but still. Um, so yeah, that that's that's the big standout example. There are, there are numerous instances of the odd bit of damage here and there, but yeah, sinking is very, very rare. Um, the only other place where you're probably going to see any significant amount of damage or, and or sunk vessels is going to be the Pacific. But that very largely depends on how you classify a lot of the Japanese shore defences, because they did have some proper sort of dedicated bunker defences, but they also had a lot of quote-unquote shore defence positions that effectively amounted to an army artillery piece sitting in a shallow dug trench which probably counts to some degree as field artillery and not really designed for anti-shipping work and that would normally be the end of questions but this week you get a special extra question because over on the chieftain's channel as part of the chieftain's q a part 16 and a half the continuing mission at the uh, 50 minute and 20 second mark a question uh, asked him with hindsight were the dd tanks worth the effort why didn't they just take the lcts in and land the tanks directly on the beaches and chieftain mentioned it might be a question for me so i thought i'll have a crack at it so going off a number of different sources i think i've pieced together the answer is that it's a combination of factors bearing in mind that when the allies went in for these landings they were operating under a certain number of assumptions the fact that some of those assumptions may not have been borne out doesn't necessarily affect the tactics that they were using because they can only find out that some of those assumptions are wrong by actually being on the beach. Now, <clears throat> one of those assumptions was that the Germans would have defences all the way down the beach, uh, all the way down to the low tide mark. In fact, um, Rommel had been under the impression or the belief that the Allies would probably land at high tide because if you landed at high tide you would be able to have your troops go the minimum possible distance before they hit the defences, therefore you'd suffer less casualties. So logically that's when you would land, so the German defences were concentrated closer to the high tide mark. Whereas the Allies were actually planning on landing midway between low tide and high tide as the tide was rising. Part of that was because it meant that landing craft would have to run in through fewer defences and this is sort of the sliding scale if you land at really low tide you're farther away from beach defences so more of your landing craft survive but more of your troops will die because they've got longer to distance to cover and if you land at absolute high tide then you've got less distance to cover but you're probably going to lose a lot more landing craft to in beach defences as they get closer so halfway was kind of a, a compromise on that factor but there's also the fact that if you run a ship or a landing craft ashore at high tide and the tide is coming out then there's a very good chance your landing craft gets stuck and then that's not good for anybody whereas if you land halfway up the beach at on a rising tide then the tide itself is going to float your ship off um, even if the weight of out getting rid of the men and vehicles aboard doesn't already do that but it, it guarantees that as long as your land, landing craft is still able to float it can be maneuvered off in fairly short order and obviously go back pick up more equipment uh, and men or just get out of the way for, of the next wave so that's why they were landing at that point however they were worried about the vulnerability specifically of the LCTs, the landing craft tank. And when you look at the difference between the smaller landing craft that were being used to land troops and the LCTs, you can see why. So there's a variety of smaller landing craft, 
but broadly speaking, the landing craft that you see at D-Day landing troops range between 10 and 50 tons and 40 up to 40 feet long up to uh, in the case of some of the slightly larger ones maybe up to about 50 feet maybe maybe slightly more here or there there's a couple that are just over 50 feet but 30 to 50 feet 10 to 50 tons give or take and so as you might imagine there are quite a lot of them and if you lose one or two obviously that's not good for anyone's side but it's not a massive tragedy in the overall scheme of events there whereas if you look at the lcts the lct is about two-thirds the speed of the average troop carrying landing craft they're also much larger they're 120 almost up to 200 foot long depending on the make and model most of them are around about 160 feet long the Mark Threes, for example, are 192, so they're quite a bit larger. Mark Three, Mark Four are the some of the largest ones, and they weigh over 500, and in some cases over 600 tons. These are quite substantial vessels, and if the beach defences are going to go after anything, they're going to go after the big, obvious, substantial landing craft because it doesn't take a genius to figure out that they either carry an awful lot of men or something even worse, like let's say tanks. And the Allies had something of an overestimation, generally, of what the heavy beach defences were actually going to be like. Hence why there were cruisers, destroyers, battleships, etc, etc, etc. Now, it never hurts to overestimate the enemy defences and pound everything flat with as much firepower as you've got. But when the Allies are running all these calculations, they're thinking, OK, so we've got possibly beach defences running all the way down to low tide. We've got these much larger, much more vulnerable, much more obvious landing craft tank targets. And whilst they have a similar draft to the troop carriers, they're slower, which is going to make them an even easier target for the for the enemy. And because they're larger, we don't have as many of them, so every one we lose is going to hurt a lot more than a, sort of a 50-footer carrying a few dozen men. And all of this adds up to, do we really want to risk running these things into the teeth of enemy defences right from the word go? There were some discussions about armouring up some of the LCTs to allow them to run in and, and, and drop tanks off anyway. The problem, of course, being that the more armour you add, the deeper the draft, so the more vulnerable they are to the defences and the further away from the beach they can land the tanks anyway because they're going to ground out earlier. So, with the idea of the duplex drive tank, it was obviously, well, if we can offload the tanks away from shore, then our LCTs are less vulnerable, and also there's a bit more of an element of surprise, because to be perfectly honest, you're going to see an LCT full of tanks if you're on a uh, in a defensive gun nest overlooking the beach when it gets close, whereas if you kick the tanks out half a mile or a mile offshore, if you've got a bunch of very angry infantry landing in front of you, you probably aren't paying too much attention to stuff that's half a mile away from you and appears to have stopped. So there would be a certain element of surprise because you can't, really can't see all that much of a DD tank while it's motoring along. Um, you'd probably think it was maybe some kind of adrift life raft until suddenly a Sherman appears out of the water. So that there was a certain element of surprise there as well. So all of this added up to this concept of yeah let's launch these dd tanks uh, and we'll use them as our amphibious assault um, capability and then once the beach defenses have been cleared by a combination of offshore fire the dd tanks themselves and the men that they're supporting then it's slightly less dangerous then we can run the lcts in and we can offload more reinforcements more directly this is all great and bearing in mind the lcts are not just there to land tanks. The LCTs are also there to be able to land trucks with supplies and also because of their sheer size, cargo um, before the Mulberry Harbours and such can be set up. So you can't really say, oh, we're going to send all our LCTs in and ho hope we get maybe a third of them back. You need those tanks, to, the, the, not well, you need the tanks, but you also need the LCTs to keep the momentum going on the beach because it's no good 
landing a massive first wave, losing a bunch of your landing craft, and then the troops and the tanks all run out of ammunition and everything in the space of a half an hour to a few hours because there's no, there's no no real supply line left to bring bring more ammunition ashore for example now what actually happened at d day is a slightly different matter because obviously the individual captains of the individual vessels could make their own decisions and it's not exactly like the admiralty was able to micromanage everything to that kind of degree so whilst some DD tanks were launched in calmer waters, some were launched in deeper waters and rougher waters, some were launched closer to shore, some were launched further away from shore, but because the seas on the 6th of June 1944 were somewhat worse than they'd really thought ideal, which contributed to the loss of a number of the DDs, there were actually a fair few LCT um, skippers who just went, you know what, uh, I don't actually care we are going in and they they went in and either delivered their tanks directly to the shore or near enough as makes no difference directly to the shore so although the dd tanks had to do a little bit of a swim it was nothing like the several miles that some of the tanks had to attempt and some of them did suffer for it some of them were hit quite badly by beach defenses what few a couple of us were sunk and took their tanks down with them so there was a certain degree of correctness to the Allies' fears pre-planning, but as we know, for most of the beaches, the defences were either more successfully suppressed by the initial bombardments than they thought, or just weren't there in the same kind of strength as was thought, for all sorts of reasons. Um, so, looking back in hindsight, it might be relatively easy to say, yeah, um, given the seas, given the actual state of German defences, it probably would have been better for the LCTs on a lot of the beaches to run in a lot closer, either right up to shore or, or almost, almost directly offshore and drop their tanks off. But that's hindsight speaking and not really something that the planners before D-Day, when they're making the decisions as to where they're going to launch the tanks from, could have realistically been expected to know and as i said for all the reasons just discussed it's not something that given the information they had it w it wouldn't be responsible to risk sending the lcts in in wave one and so some relatively important channel admin the trip to sweden at the moment is still on uh, I know some of you have let me know that the Vass Museum has closed to the public for the period that I'm going to be there. However, um, I have checked with them and I <coughs> can still be admitted as an individual to film because I'm also going to be doing interviews. So as a separate matter, I can still do what I need to do. In fact, I might actually have better filming opportunities because it's uh, going to be empty. So at the moment, I'm still planning to go there. Um, so for those of you who wanted to meet up, and there's a surprising number of you actually in Stockholm, um, I'm, let's say, at the, as of the time of, uh, recording, um, and at the time of transmission, I am still, the, 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 it's still on, basically. Um, a few of you have also asked what's going to happen, sorry, it's fireworks going off, um, What's going to happen with the five minute guides list? Because if you look, you'll notice it's actually getting relatively short. Don't worry, it doesn't mean the five minute guides are going to stop. Basically, what happened was uh, back when I was compiling the list from various requests, I got to a point where the video description was just getting stupidly long. So I stopped updating the list in the video description, but I kept updating it on a master Word document back on my computer. So there's a lot more, trust me, there's pushing a decade's worth of five minute guide requests on my <laughs> on my list on my computer. So what will happen is once we run down to the end of the current five minute list, I'll just take the next 52 entries from uh, my Word document and put those in to subsequent videos. It just basically means that you don't have to be confronted by several pages of scrolling if you ever look at the video description. And lastly, um, 
a couple of people have suggested with the length the Patreon dry docks are getting that maybe I should just make the dry dock a Patreon's only thing. And um, at the moment, and as far as I can see for any foreseeable future, I'm not going to be doing that because whilst obviously I do appreciate the the um, Patreons and obviously they get a guaranteed uh, question per month in the dry dock if they choose to utilise it, then but and for everybody else obviously it's it's a little bit of a potluck because you ask your questions and i can only select so many per dry dock so there is that difference but i still do believe that everyone should have a chance to have their question answered um and so as long as it remains viable i'm going to keep the dry docks going in this pattern um if if the Patreon dry docks do start getting to the truly absurd length they were getting uh, before when I had to go and switch over to do it, when I switched over to half and halving them, then we'll have to see what happens at that point. But we haven't reached that point yet, at least as far as my endurance for recording these things has gotten. And so we'll we'll stick with the program as it is at the moment. Um, so that, yeah, that's that's, I think, pretty much it. Um, and once again thank you very much for listening and hope to see you again in another video